So if we posit that indeed obesity plays a causal role in cancer, there's no dispute that the correlation is quite strong. That, I, I mean, I, you, you don't need to be an epidemiologist to understand that. The question is, is that correlation causative? Now with tobacco, the correlation is so strong that it's very hard to find somebody who doesn't appreciate that there's a causal relationship there. I did see somebody on Twitter the other day try to argue that tobacco has no relationship to cancer, but let's put that guy aside for a moment. Um, with obesity, it's a little harder because the hazard ratio isn't nearly as large as it is with tobacco, and obesity is, is actually harder to disentangle from its other multivariate parameters. It comes with so much else. So the person who is obese eats a different way, sleeps a different way, exercises a different way. It, the list goes on and on and on of other things that could, that could potentially play a role. But again, for the purpose of the discussion, if we posit that obesity is causally related to cancer, then the next step is, is it one of the growth factors associated with obesity, of which insulin is one? Is it other changes that are prominent with obesity, such as inflammation? Um, how do you then arrive at, you know, for example, insulin being um, the, you know, the prime candidate, to use the word prime again, within the obesity paradigm that's driving this? And that says nothing, by the way, of where we're going to then have to go, which is, is it the enabler or is it the primary cause? I mean... My argument is that, um, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, as you said, these are very complicated. <laughs> you know, there's, there, there's many different factors that play out, but, but my ultimate argument is that the obesity is not causal, that it's actually the hyperinsulinemia that is simultaneously driving the obesity and the cancer cell proliferation. Uh, so I think part of the evidence for that is that, um, you know, there are people who are quote unquote metabolically healthy, obese that, um, you know, they store more nutrients in their, their subcutaneous fat and more energy in their subcutaneous fat and not the visceral fat. And they tend to be metabolic, metabolically healthy and do not have insulin resistance. And they seem to be no more likely to get cancer. Whereas when you look at the insulin resistance and, and people who are thinner, but clearly, you know, I think it's most of the people actually do have insulin resistance. And when you see that metabolic disruption in people who aren't obese, they, that also tends to correlate with cancer. So I think you can, to some extent, dissociate the obesity, uh, but then you still have to, you know, the insulin cancer correlation isn't as strong as, as smoking either. So, you know, you still have a lot to work with. And then, you know, there's the question that you brought up is, I, I think this is what you're referring to is the insulin actually you know, the first prime step in the process, the hyperinsulinemia, or is it, you know, a mutation that occurs for some other reason and, and allows the cancer cell to, to take advantage of that hyperinsulinemia? So yeah, is the model basically that if you take, um, you know, a two by two matrix where you have um, chromosomal insult, yes or no, hyperinsulinemia, yes, no. So which one gets cancer? Is it only the double positive, right? Yeah. I mean, we would agree that the double negative almost assuredly does not, but the, yeah. and we would probably agree that the double positive does. The question is what's happening on the other corners, right? What's happening yeah. in the individual who has the chromosomal insult in the absence of hyperinsulinemia and what's happening to the person without the chromosomal insult who is hyperinsulinemic? To me, those are the questions that matter a lot, and they matter a lot for for the sake of prevention. Now, the 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 obviously, um, and this is the approach that I take clinically, right? Which is, um, let's be overly aggressive and assume that both of those are sufficient. Then you would say, well, you have to put yourself in the double negative box, which is avoid hyperinsulinemia and any sign of metabolic ill health and do every single thing imaginable to reduce the burden of DNA insult. 
and you try to narrow yourself and confine yourself into this very narrow box. And then you layer on a whole bunch of other things like really aggressive screening and all this other stuff. Um, but, but so, so that's kind of what you would do if you don't have a choice, if you're absent, perfect information, you have to probably act more aggressively. But I still think this question of which of the two positive, negative, negative, positive squares, uh, you know, until we, uh, at least for me, I don't have a great understanding of those. And because I think they exist in both. I think there are examples and counterexamples for both. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.